This is Dr. Karen, and this is the Are They 18 Yet podcast, where I help parents raise independent, self-sufficient kids without sacrificing their own identity and sense of purpose. I'm here to share practical day-to-day solutions for raising kind, successful, well-adjusted human beings, and actionable advice for supporting systemic changes so we can make this world a more inclusive, accepting place now and for future generations. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and this is episode 14 of the Are They 18 Yet podcast. This is a solo episode where I share my own personal journey with neurodiversity. I know that as someone who is a parent and as someone who has made a career out of supporting kids who have all sorts of different neurological profiles, different sensory needs, and different ways of experiencing the world, one of the things that has been the most helpful for me in understanding how to be a good advocate for other people is learning how to be a good advocate for myself. There were so many things that didn't make sense to me, certain things that I experienced, certain things that used to bother me or that I used to struggle with growing up. And knowing what I know now, I have a different understanding of what was happening when it comes to my own sensory needs, my needs as far as things that trigger me, things that are calming to me, things that help me perform at my best. And one of the most powerful ways that I've found to develop empathy for other people who might have neurological needs that are a little bit different than what we might consider, quote, normal, and I'm using air quotes as I say the word normal because who even knows what normal is? And of course, I get into that a little bit on this episode. But one of the most powerful things that I have found is experiencing this as not just somebody who is a therapist who is providing help and support for people who are trying to navigate this, but also to have experienced it on my own. So in this episode, I share my own personal journey, how I have been able to navigate my own sensory needs and find ways to compensate, find ways to advocate for myself, and also find activities that help me thrive. And I share a little bit about how I can use those insights and how you can use those insights to support yourself and the kids in your life. Before we get started, I wanted to share a brand new resource that I have for parents called the Time Tracking Journal that's designed to help parents help their kids become more organized and responsible. The Time Tracking Journal is for you if you have a child who gets easily overwhelmed by any type of task that is challenging to them, something like homework, chores, or even getting themselves ready in the morning, maybe even cleaning their room if they tend to procrastinate, if they tend to dig their heels in and sometimes seem like they aren't sure where to start and you're not really sure if it's an issue of motivation, if it's that they aren't sure what to do and you're just struggling to figure out how to support them, I walk through an evidence-based strategy for supporting your kids through those types of tasks in the time tracking journal. To grab this journal, all you need to do is go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash time journal, and you will be able to sign up. Again, that's drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash time journal to grab that resource. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Karen. And in this episode, I wanted to talk a little bit about neurodiversity, what it means, and my own personal journey surrounding it. So first, let's talk a little bit about a couple key terms that are going to help you to get a little bit of context. First, I wanted to define 
the term neurotypical. When we say someone is neurotypical, what that means is that that particular person has not been diagnosed with any condition that impacts their brain in any way. So they're, they don't have some type of a medical diagnosis or disability that is thought to impact them neurologically. As I have learned more and more about neurodiversity, I've also pondered my own neurological status because in the past I have identified as a neurotypical person because I have not been given any specific diagnoses like autism or ADHD or dyslexia. But when I dig a little bit deeper and look at some of the characteristics of some of these conditions and you know, thinking about the fact that a lot of these conditions are a spectrum, whereas someone may or may not give you an official diagnosis, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have certain tendencies. And so really what it has been for me has been kind of a journey around, all right, what does normal mean? And does that even mean anything anymore? And is that something I should strive to be? Or should I simply just embrace my own tendencies and learn to work with them and learn to lean into my strengths and be aware of things that may be potentially considered weaknesses in some situations, but really just have a better understanding of them so I can be a better advocate for myself. And I hope that if you are a parent, if you are someone who does have some diagnosis and as a result you do not identify as neurotypical, or if you are supporting children who have certain diagnoses, maybe they're autistic, have ADHD, and you want to have a better understanding of them, I think sometimes looking at your own profile can be really helpful and empowering into just developing empathy. One of the main things that I would ask you listening to this episode to ponder is, what is normal? What does that really mean? What does neurotypical really mean? And the reason I ask is because in my own journey and the way that it started out for me is that as a child, I always was was very anxious and I never really knew how to quiet the voice in my head that was always worrying about something and always stressing out about something. And I, as a child, never really learned a strategy to quiet that voice and sit with it. And so I really carried that into my adulthood and there were certain things that I did or I felt that I needed to do as a child that I always thought were kind of weird. And <laughs> I I had a lot of shame around them because I realized that other people didn't do some of the things that I did and certain situations were really difficult for me and I didn't understand why. I had this sense that there was something wrong with me or that I wasn't, again, quote, normal. Let's go back way, way, way <laughs> to the time that I was was really little. I was a thumb sucker, and I always had some kind of a sensory thing with self-soothing behaviors. And thumb sucking is something that a lot of kids do. And I remember it was was something that I did as well. I don't remember how I quit. But I just know now that I don't do it anymore. But I still am a nail biter and I, I pick at the skin around my nails. So sometimes I wonder if that self-soothing behavior and that sensory input that I was getting from sucking my thumb was possibly replaced by chewing or biting my nails. And that is something I just turned 40 this past year and I have not figured out how to get rid of that habit. I also have some other things. I'll twirl my hair and always have to be doing something with my hands. And I've tried all the things. I've tried the, oh, you know, nail polish that doesn't taste good. 
I have tried painting my nails so they look nice and they pretty much never look nice. I have gotten fake nails. I have tried bribery. I've had, I've even tried hypnosis and I haven't figured out how to handle it yet. So there's obviously some kind of sensory thing going on there. But also I had some other things going on that I have managed to replace with somewhat healthier behaviors but looking back, it makes me kind of wonder if, again, maybe I, on the spectrum of neurotypical or not neurotypical, <laughs> if maybe I'm not. So looking back, I know that I used to do things, again, that were self-soothing. And a lot of these things were um, or where I would I would need some kind of movement or rocking. And I know that People who work with with autistic individuals know that sometimes there might be some stimming behaviors and a lot of times it is to regulate. And so it could be something like rocking, bouncing, repeating certain behaviors over and over again. And it's it's often serves a purpose of self-regulation and calming. For me, I think it was some kind of a self-soothing or even almost like a meditation. And so what I did when I was younger is that I had a rocking horse. And what I would used to do is that I would, I had one of those Fisher Price record players and I would just sit there and go on this rocking horse for hours and I would play music over and over again. I would listen to my parents' records and gosh, I would, let's see, what would, I would listen to, Madonna, I would listen to the monkeys. There was one of those Alvin and the Chipmunks records and then Alan Sherman. I don't know if anyone knows who that is, but he's kind of like Weird Al Yankovic, but he's the guy who was popular when my parents were kids. He did Hello Mudda, Hello Fada. That might be the only thing that people might even recognize. The point is, is that I had my go-to songs in my music that I would listen to. So to, for me, that was kind of a repetitive, calming behavior. Eventually, the rocking horse got too small for me. And I also, by the time I was in elementary school, realized this is kind of weird that you're sitting on this rocking horse all the time. And I didn't even fit on it anymore. So what I did instead was my parents had this swing set. You can buy those swing sets and assemble them. And so I switched to going on the swings and I would do the same thing. I would listen to music. I think my go-tos changed by the time I was in grade school. There was a lot of do kids on the block involved in there. And yes, some Rick Astley. I was always Rick rolling it, but, and there were some other ones in there as well. I would just go outside and go on the swings, listen to all of my tunes. And that was my my stimming. And that lasted, I would say, probably through high school. When, when it got to the point where I wouldn't, I wasn't able to go on the swing set anymore, I was able to, I could do it without the music, but I would ride my bike to the park. And whenever I needed to just clear my head, I would just go and go on the swings for hours. And it was very calming. And I would say that I didn't realize it at the time, but it was probably for me what a lot of people are doing when they're meditating, where you're just kind of sitting there with your thoughts. And um, I think I also would do what you would refer to as rehearsal, with, which is a cognitive strategy, which basically just means that if you have something coming up that you know, some event coming up, let's say that you're going to give a, a presentation or you have an athletic event and you are thinking about how to prepare, you do rehearsal and visualization in your head. So I would do a lot of that. Sometimes I would think about things that happened in the past that were situations where maybe I didn't like how it went and I would replay it in my mind and think about how I would have done it if I would have known what I know now, and I would kind of relive the moment over and over again and think about what I would have done differently and what I can do differently in the future. And I would just, again, think about a lot of different things. I guess I always thought of it as daydreaming, but maybe I was meditating without realizing it. I pretty much did that all the way through college. 
and or not through college, but until I went to college, because, you know, then I was going to go away to college and I realized this is weird, (laughs) you know, or I thought it was weird. I thought, you know, this isn't something that I feel is socially acceptable for a college student to be doing. And I did feel like it was some kind of a need that I had to be met, but I was realizing that it was something that other people might think is weird, or at least that was my perception. So I found other ways to get that need met. For me, when I was in college, it was more exercise. So instead of going on a swing, walking, doing cardio, going on the cardio machines, things like that, which I wasn't in organized sports anymore. And so obviously that was something that I wanted to do because I always had been so in some kind of organized sport until I went to college. That was important to me to to stay healthy and things like that. But Looking back, I think that a lot of the activities that I picked did fit that sensory profile of just that long, steady, repetitive motion. One of the sports that I did when I was younger was swimming, and I always found swimming very calming. And if you think about what a swimming workout is, you're just swimming laps. It's very repetitive. Now... As an adult, when I was in college, when I was doing all of the the cardio, I decided my sisters were running a marathon. I decided that I wanted to run with them, and that is when I found running. And so a lot of the activities that I do now do fit that need where it's – and with when you're an endurance athlete, it's a lot of repetitive, the same thing over and over again – And when I look back on my profile of the things that I liked to do when I was a kid, I have basically found what I have perceived as a a more socially acceptable way to get my sensory needs met. It's kind of interesting because when I was younger, I used to always go on the swings at the park. And now a couple of times I've taken my stepdaughter to the park and I've hopped on the swings with her and it makes me nauseous now. So I don't really know what that's about. I think it is possible that your sensory system can change as you get older. But those are some things that I have done in my life to get some of my sensory needs met. But when I think about it, sometimes I wonder, and some of those behaviors that I had when I was younger that I was self-conscious about and that as I got older, I thought, is this weird? Are people going to think this is strange that I do this? Maybe I should do something else. It sometimes makes me wonder where I do fall on that spectrum of neurodiversity and neuro being neurotypical or not neurotypical, especially because I do have some things that I haven't yet quite figured out how to navigate, such as the skin picking, which I would say definitely is problematic. My nails are pretty gross right now as I'm sitting here recording this. I also had some other things that came up that I thought, huh, I never realized this at the time, but now knowing what I know, working with different people who do have different sensory needs, I always felt like there was something wrong with me or like I was being difficult, but maybe it was more of a sensory need. Um, When I was younger, when I would, I've always had really long, thick hair. And so obviously I would always have to put my hair back in a ponytail when I would go do sports, when I would go swimming, or when I would just be out running around and I didn't want my hair flying all over the place. And I was very particular about where my ponytail sat on my head, it really bothered me if it wasn't exactly symmetrically in the middle of the back of my head. And so I always had (laughs) ponytail issues. I remember getting in arguments with my mom because she would be trying to do my hair and it just didn't feel right to me. And I didn't like the way it felt on my head. And I had a lot of tantrums over it. And so sometimes I wonder, huh, that was a, that was a sensory thing and i thought i was just being difficult <laughs> and had some other things that i do you know sometimes like to joke about but i also had some issues with clothes where i did not like the way certain materials felt certain seams felt against 
my body when I was wearing clothes. It took me a really long time to be able to wear jeans. So I think, let's see. So I grew up when I was in grade school, it would have been late 80s, early 90s. So what was, well, at least what I thought was in then, they had these bike shorts that had this stripe that would go down the side of your leg. And I got them in all these different colors. I had fluorescent pink and black, and I had this electric blue and lime green. And I thought I was so cool. And for the longest time, those were all I could wear because with spandex, it sort of fits to your body. But when you put jeans on, it is a little more restrictive And it just drove me crazy. And I could not, for the longest time, find a pair of jeans that fit. So I just wore spandex all the time, probably way longer than that trend was ever cool, if it was ever cool to begin with. And again, I I remember getting teased about it because I was walking around in these spandex bike shorts when I clearly wasn't going to go do exercise, but it was because that was all that was comfortable for me. And now I can wear jeans. I remember around the time that I was maybe 13 or 14, I was able to ease myself in. So I found one pair of jeans. They were my sister's and they actually fit me and they didn't drive me crazy. And so I was like, okay, this is the one pair of jeans that I can wear. And finally, I would borrow them so much that my sister was just like, you can have the jeans. (laughs) I'll just give them to you for your birthday present. So she let me have the jeans. And then eventually I was able to find others that were like that. And now I can wear all kinds of different jeans. Although I am, (laughs) I will admit that I'm kind of glad that leggings and jeggings are in right now because I do still prefer that. But the, the main thing is, is that I was able to increase my tolerance for those things. And obviously I'm able to wear my hair and a ponytail and all kinds of different things now. But back when I was younger, I did not know how to ease myself into those kinds of things. So I'm not quite sure where I fit on that sensory spectrum, and I know that I definitely have some things going on that I was able to work through, but I think the thing to take away is that, number one, if you do have things like that, or if you are working with kids who have different things that when you whenever you have them in a certain situation, they're just angry and agitated, I would encourage you to just look at the look at the environment and see if there is anything that might be triggering to them see if it might be some kind of a sensory issue see if there some might be something there that is causing them to feel dysregulated because i know that a lot of the situations where i personally had a hard time it was because i did not feel regulated and and the sensory stuff was huge for me so the needing movement and um and needing to feel like whatever whatever environment that I was in was not was not triggering to me. There are still certain things now that bother me and as an adult I'm able to usually modify my environment so that I know that I can get myself in a situation that is more comfortable. One example for me is that I don't like to sit around in in wet sweaty clothes. And especially when my pants are wet, like if you're if you went and worked out and you're kind of standing around, I'm a runner. So there's a lot of events where you go, you run the race and a lot of times people are hanging out afterwards. And especially if it's in the summer, you get pretty sweaty. I live in Illinois, so it gets pretty hot during the summer months. And so if I am going to an event where I know that I'm going to be sitting around in clothes that are all wet, sticky, and gross, that I just know that I need to pack dry clothes. So that might be something if you find yourself feeling cranky and agitated, or if you have a child who, whenever they get into a certain situation, just again, seems agitated, there could be some simple environmental things from a sensory standpoint that you can do in order to figure out how to make them feel better and make them feel less agitated. And a lot of times you can work with different professionals, um, like an occupational therapist that can help you navigate these things. But 
you can really find out a lot on your own by just being aware of, you know what, in certain situations, I know that my my child is just not regulated. And so we're just going to make these modifications so that everyone can enjoy themselves and have a good time in whatever situation we want to be in. I'm going to take a quick break to talk about a brand new resource I have for parents. Everyone knows that homework isn't a kid's favorite thing to do, but wouldn't it be nice to get through the day without meltdowns and power struggles? For a lot of parents that I work with, it starts in the morning as they're trying to get everyone out the door on time and then continues throughout the day as clutter is piling up in every corner of the house. But when it's time to get homework done, that's when the daily arguments really start. And sometimes kids are willing to spend more time arguing than actually getting their work done, which makes it really hard to enjoy the evening as a family or as a parent have time for self-care after everyone goes to bed. So if this sounds familiar, you're certainly not alone. In my time as a pediatric speech pathologist supporting students with diverse learning needs, I have heard these things from a lot of the families that I've worked with. But what a lot of people don't realize is that things like defiance, refusing to do work, avoidance, procrastination, lack of motivation, focus and effort, or just overall underperforming when it comes to homework and schoolwork A lot of these things are symptoms of a bigger problem, and procrastination is often a sign of a skill-based issue that impacts many highly intelligent people, which means if you have a child who does tend to procrastinate, it doesn't mean that they have a behavior problem or that they're lazy. It simply means that they might not have the right skills to know how to get that task done. The good news is that when you address the root cause with the right strategy, it's possible to help kids keep track of their things, pay attention to details, become aware of deadlines, start and finish tasks in a reasonable amount of time, or to be able to sense how long tasks will take so that they can plan ahead. And most importantly, experience some success so they can envision themselves being successful again in the future. That's why I've created the Time Tracking Journal. The Time Tracking Journal is a simple toolkit that walks parents through a set of strategies that will help build time management, motivation, and self-confidence in their kids while they're doing daily tasks like homework and chores. Once you learn how to use a strategy, this is something really simple that you can do in about 10 to 15 minutes a day. And when you sign up for the time tracking journal, not only do you get the actual toolkit, which is a downloadable journal that just walks you through a set of steps to help build these skills in your kids as they're doing their day-to-day tasks, you'll also learn some strategies to help improve time management skills, to help kids understand how done looks, and to help kids get tasks done more efficiently and effectively and build critical thinking skills in the process. To grab the time tracking journal, all you need to do is go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash time journal. One strategy done consistently can be the difference between constant power struggles and a peaceful, thriving home. And that's exactly what I show you how to do with the time tracking journal. So just go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash time journal to check it out. One area where I encourage parents to really be aware is if your child likes to be around a lot of people and noise, and if that is something that is energizing to them, or at least just neutral where they don't mind it, versus if they find it very dysregulating and triggering, and if they need some quiet calm. I know that I was someone, and I'm still someone who likes to have that calm, quiet, 
time to myself and where I don't have to necessarily talk or engage with certain people. Obviously, there are certain people who I am able to be around more easily than others, like my husband and and my own child. But again, just being aware of that can be really helpful for parents. So that's all of my sensory stuff. I had one other thing I wanted to share when it comes to my own profile before I wrap up here. And this is going back to the whole concept of neurotypical, what does it mean, and also why it's important to embrace neurodiversity. And it goes back to the question of what is normal? What does that even mean? I mentioned before that I did have a tendency to get into bouts of anxiety where I would have these thoughts that would just, like I would just worry about things over and over again, and I would get stuck in certain thought patterns. And I always thought that there was something wrong with me. And as I got older and I was able to do some research on my own, I think around the time that I was in high school, I started reading about obsessive compulsive disorder and reading about the symptoms When I started to read about the tendencies to have intrusive thoughts, I was like, wow, this kind of sounds like what I'm doing. So I kind of diagnosed myself with it, but I was really embarrassed about it, so I didn't say anything. And I did notice that when I went to college, I would go through peaks and valleys where there might be some times when it was worse. And then there might be some times where I was feeling pretty good for a while. And there are all kinds of things that had an impact. Weather and exposure to sun had a big impact for me. I always noticed that if I spent too much time inside and I didn't have exposure to sunlight, then I would be less likely to feel good. I would feel more likely to be depressed and mopey. It was always more likely that I would have some kind of an episode where I would just not feel great in the winter months. So I thought, eh, maybe it's seasonal depression or maybe it's just that I need to get outside more. So the way that I compensate for that is that I get outside all year round, even though I live in Illinois, I just like to do things outside all year round. I go running outside all year round. I will go outside and walk my dog. We go for hikes in the winter. And I like to ski and do winter sports. And I also like to do a lot of things in the summer. But I live in the Midwest, so you just have to learn how to dress and <laughs> learn what to wear outside in the cold so that you can comfortably participate in those types of things. And I find that really helpful. But I always had this lingering thing in the back of my mind. I think I have OCD and should I do something about this? Is this something that I should have diagnosed? And I did have a point back in 2015, 2016, where I was just, it was around the time that I started my business. I was also working full time in the schools. I was actually teaching. I had a couple adjunct assignments. I was doing a lot and I was getting really stressful and I had some things going on in my personal life. It all kind of added up, and that was around the time that I decided to seek out some biofeedback, and I will give some links in the show notes of this episode, but basically it's just a method where you use different different methods of breathing to impact certain functions in your body, and I also did something that's known as neurofeedback that impacts your brainwave patterns. And I do want to have a future episode where I dive into what neurofeedback and biofeedback are, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this particular episode. I do plan on having some kind of an expert come on in the future to talk about those things, but I am just, for the purposes of this episode, I'll give you some links to, if you want to look further into either of those methods. The main thing, though, is that... It was getting to the point that I thought I should seek outside help because I was having some physical symptoms. The main thing was that I was having a hard time falling asleep. I did have a lot of anxiety and I was just not very happy. And I also was having some issues with circulation and was having Raynaud's syndrome where you you have poor circulation in your hands and your feet. 
a lot of times your your hands and feet can turn blue. And I actually had a physical therapist that I was working with that was helping me with some running gait retraining that noticed that my feet were discolored. And he said, you know what, you should have this looked at just to make sure that there's not some kind of an autoimmune issue going on. And there wasn't. And they just basically said, maybe it's stress. And so that's what caused me to look into biofeedback and neurofeedback because biofeedback is something that can help with Raynaud's if it's brought on by stress and not secondary to some other conditions. So if you do have something like that and symptoms like that, definitely follow through with a healthcare practitioner to rule out autoimmune diseases and things like that, which which I did. But throughout that process, because anxiety was involved, I did seek out some practitioners that that specialized in, in managing anxiety and and using different modalities in order to help regulate your brainwave patterns. And what I found about myself was that I actually, even though I had always identified as neurotypical because I thought, oh, if you don't have an autism diagnosis or if you haven't been diagnosed with ADHD, then that means you're neurotypical. And I also thought that because I didn't have blatant hyperactivity, that there was no way that I fell on the ADHD spectrum in any way. And that I didn't have any signs and symptoms just because I didn't fit the obvious signs and symptoms that we often see, which is just impulsive behaviors and and things like that. I was always very quiet and subdued and schooled. So there was never anything that came up that would indicate I might fall anywhere on the spectrum of ADHD. But the practitioner that I went to see who does neurofeedback that really works with people on anxiety, works with a lot of people who have issues falling asleep because of stress, he did a very detailed assessment of me. And what he found was that I actually did come out clinically significant for anxiety, OCD tendencies, not obsessive compulsive disorder, did not diagnose me with that, but just that I had some tendencies, but also that I did come out clinically significant on one of the ADHD scales for ADHD that's associated with the limbic system. And basically what he found was that even though I didn't have blatant, obvious symptoms, like I at the time was, I think I had just finished my doctoral dissertation, which required a lot of discipline and planning, and was able to finish that on my own. There were a lot of things where I was getting a ton of work done and potentially over-functioning. And so I never thought, oh, I might come out clinically significant for something like this. But what he found was that what I was doing was that in order to get myself to focus, I was skipping over some of the brainwave patterns that are required for that relaxed, calm focus that you might need just day to day when you're just kind of going through your daily routine. And I was either asleep or I was in high beta, which basically means that those brain waves that you are in when you are in fight or flight. I was either asleep or I was full throttle. And I didn't know how to not have my foot on the gas constantly. And because of that, it was causing a lot of physical symptoms. And the thing is, is that I was doing that as a compensatory mechanism because it was either all on or all off. And I don't have any formal diagnosis as far as ADHD or autism or anything like that. But the thing to take away from this is that I actually was having a hard time focusing because I was not able to focus and get myself to sit and do work in a way that wasn't fight or flight mode. And because of that, I had to get myself into hyper focus. And that is actually common in some people with ADHD. I know my husband has that tendency as well, where it's either you are all on or all off. You have nothing in the middle where there's any middle ground. While I was overcompensating 
and I was getting a lot done and it didn't look to anyone outside like I was having any type of attention issues internally because I was internalizing so much, it was causing a lot of physical symptoms. I could feel them. People couldn't necessarily see them. So I think as a practitioner and as a parent, if you have a child who does seem to be prone to anxiety, if you have a child who seems prone to be all in or all out on things where it's like all or nothing, they're either not focused at all or they're hyper-focused. That's kind of how I was, and I was doing that as a compensatory mechanism because I wasn't able to find that balance between a healthy amount of focus, and that is something that I've worked on personally over the last couple of years, and and I did have some treatment with that particular person so that I, I'm able to sleep and things like that and, and find more of a balance. I do definitely have those tendencies to hyper-focus where while someone like my husband, he will, if there's some kind of background noise, he's not able to work. And that that happens with a lot of people who have ADHD. But on the other hand, what happens with me is that if I am focused on something, it's like I have tunnel vision and you cannot, you, you can't get in and something could be going on. The house could be on fire and I'm just sitting here working and can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing, especially when you, you know, forget to eat and shower and go to the bathroom and all those things. Um, (laughs) Not that I get into that state all the time, but that is certainly something that can happen where you just get in where, where I would sometimes get into a state of just, I'm in such a flow that I... I get almost anxious when somebody asks me to put it down and go do something else. And um, if you have a child who's like that, who is who does tend to hyperfocus, where they have a hard time putting something down, it could be because of, of of something that has to do with their neurological profile. And that is definitely something that you can prep for. It might be something that they're always working on, where. They're aware of that tendency and they might be aware of, okay, I need to give myself some bumpers so that I don't sit here and do whatever it is for six hours. I give myself some kind of a hard stopping point where I need to put this down and come back to it later kind of a thing. So a lot of times just structuring your environment can be really helpful for those kinds of things. To wrap this all up, the key takeaway here is number one. Do I identify as neurotypical? I'm not sure I do. (laughs) So um, I, I see that as kind of a gift because I actually decided that I wanted to have a career helping people with ADHD, helping people who are autistic, helping people who have other diagnoses that may cause them to also not identify as neurotypical. As somebody who helps people who neurodiverse, I think that that also is helpful to myself uh, be someone who also identifies as neurodiverse. Not quite sure where I fall, not quite sure that I'll ever figure it out, but I know that I'm on there somewhere. So I am, for all of you who fall on the spectrum somewhere in some way or are supporting someone who is, I'm working through it with you. The other thing is that I think we need to define what normal is, and I could probably go through another episode on that. One of the things that I did find when I was doing some research on different modalities that could help with with Raynaud's, with the insomnia and things like that, is that a lot of people, when you actually look at their EEGs, they're, I think, one source that I found when I was doing some research It was a book called Biofeedback for the Brain by Paul Swingle. I will link to that. But I think he said something like 40% of EEGs are normal, meaning 60% aren't. So it kind of makes you wonder, what is normal? (laughs) What is neurotypical? And uh, is that even a thing? Maybe more people are neurodiverse than we really think. So So that's the second thing is that it's not about making someone normal. It's not about fixing someone who's broken because you're not broken. Your child is not broken. It's it's just about understanding 
who you are, what you need, what your profile is so that you can understand how to navigate the world in a way that allows you to feel empowered and successful in the situations that are important to you. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing I would say is just if you have someone that you're supporting or if you are wanting to personally work through some of these things and you're just finding that certain situations are difficult, it's really important to understand what your triggers and tendencies might be because that can be the key in just allowing yourself to structure your environment in a way that allows you to navigate the world more effectively. And the other thing is, is that I, I'm just curious how many other people might have some of these things that I did, different sensory things that they're working through, or if they notice their children doing different sensory things and wondering, hmm, what's going on here? And I think with those types of things, it's it's about finding activities that allow you to self-regulate and get your needs met in a way that is not, I hate to use the term appropriate and acceptable because yes, we do want to consider cultural norms and things like that. And you don't want to do something that's really going to make it hard for you to be successful in a certain situation. But it's not all about just worrying what other people think. It can't be about that. It's it's more along the lines of, all right, how do I get my needs met and how do I be successful in this situation? And am I okay with people thinking that it's different? Or am I okay asking for what I need and explaining that, hey, I need to go do this thing in order to be able to focus or do whatever I need to do and just knowing how to ask for some of those things without feeling ashamed to do it. I think that's the other thing as well. And the more that you can understand where your kids fall, the better able you're going to be able to advocate for them and help them to learn to advocate for themselves. So, that is my story on the sensory the sensory spectrum and the neurodiversity spectrum and i hope that you found it helpful i will definitely be talking more about this in future episodes but i thought it was really important to share and like i said i mentioned a handful of things briefly in this episode that i will definitely be diving further into in future episodes. But for now, thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it and found it helpful. All right, this is a good place to wrap up, but I had just a couple housekeeping things before we end. First, don't forget to check out the time tracking journal if you want a tool to help you get through homework and chores with ease without nagging or bribes. If you struggle to get your kids to be independent with some of those day-to-day tasks that they may not like to do, but need to learn how to do in order to be independent people one day. And if you want to just have peace of mind that you're number one, helping them build the skills now that they need to eventually be successful adults one day, and Number two, a more immediate need to help you get through the day and retain your sanity at the same time. So to learn a simple set of strategies and get a simple tool that's going to help build the skills your kids need in order to be independent and organized and keep track of their assignments, just go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash time journal. Again, that's drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash time journal. Next, I wanted to remind you that it helps us so much if you leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple. All you need to do is just search for Are They 18 Yet? and you can leave us a review. There's usually a big purple button that you have to click if you're on Apple that will allow you to leave a review. So that helps us to get the show in front of more people who need it. And also, I may give you a shout out on a later episode. I'm Dr. Karen, and you're listening to the Are They 18 Yet? podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you in episode 15.